Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mendel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison. I'm director of the Mandel Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special spotlight session to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Brandeis. The mission of the Mandel Center is to develop and promote scholarship in Jewish education in order to make a deep and lasting difference on the lives of learners and the vibrancy of the Jewish community. This session and other events are, are a way of serving our mission by sharing ideas with the world, especially with Jewish educators and Jewish leaders. And I encourage you to visit the center's website for more information about our various events. In our spotlight sessions, we bring together a group of people to tackle a topic within Jewish education, sometimes a more specific or more narrow topic. So for example, in the past, We've had spotlight sessions on Machloket and on Dafyomi. Um, and in February, we'll do a spotlight session about uh, gap years in Israel. Um, and sometimes it's a broader topic. So for example, we've done spotlight sessions on art and creativity and on adult Jewish learning. And since I'm mentioning things we've done in the past, I should also mention that all of our past events are available for viewing on the website and on our YouTube channel. Um, or for listening on our podcast. Before moving on to talk about today's spotlight, I, I want to acknowledge that we're convening this session while there's a war raging in Israel and in Gaza that affects so many of us and our friends and families. Speaking just for myself, these, these past few weeks have been incredibly hard, incredibly challenging, and I'm sure that I'm not alone. So we're proceeding with our plan. We're convening this conversation, but but I do want to acknowledge how hard um, how hard this has been and how hard this continues to be for so many. So today's spotlight is a little different. I've already mentioned that we created this session in honor of Brandeis's 75th anniversary. We wanted to think and talk together about what we've learned about Jewish learning, which is a pretty broad topic. But we're, we're going to narrow it down to think about what kinds of scholarship in Jewish education have made a difference for the practice of Jewish education. And the other way that this spotlight session is a little different is that the people that we've gathered together are my colleagues and friends here at the Mandel Center. Sharon Feynman Nemzer, who's the founding director of the center, Joe Reamer, Ziva Hassenfeld, and Jonathan Krasner. I have the unbelievable good fortune of working alongside these four scholars on a daily basis. Each of them has different areas of scholarly expertise. They were trained as scholars in different traditions. They had different perspectives and ideas. And, and there's nothing more satisfying than when we get to sit together around a table, which we actually get to do on a regular basis. And challenge each other and critique ideas and arguments and sharpen and deepen our thinking. And at the same time, I also want to say that this wonderful group of colleagues share a deep commitment to the Jewish community. They've all worked in Jewish educational settings as practitioners and consultants and board members. They believe in the value of scholarship in the service of Jewish educational practice. And it is an incredible blessing to have them here as colleagues at Brandeis. So my friends, welcome to the spotlight session on the past, present, and future of Jewish learning. Um, before we begin the conversation, I also want to mention that we, for the, for the audience, that we are conducting this session in a webinar format. So uh, only the participants will be on the screen but we invite your questions to us using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We're recording the session and it will be available afterwards on all the ways that I talked about before. Okay, so um, so let's get started. Let me begin um, by asking, um, asking you to think together, to share something about how you think that scholarship makes a difference in Jewish education and a little more narrowly, when you think about, say, the last two or three decades of scholarship, what's an example that um, that comes to mind as um, as a really exquisite um, example of scholarship that that has made a difference for Jewish education? Um, Jonathan, do you want to start us off? Sure. 
first of all, thank you for convening us today, John. Um, and uh, welcome to my colleagues, my dear friends. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, especially in this moment, one can't really help but um, think about the impact of Sivan Zakai's book, My Second Favorite Country, How American Jewish Children Think About Israel. Um, this is a book that was recently published. When Sivan published it, she would she had no idea, obviously, about the horrific events um, that occurred on October 7th and the you know and in, in, in the ensuing days. Um, and um, what Sivan did in this book is something that is so uncommon uh, in our field, which is that she did a longitudinal study of young kids beginning in kindergarten and really following them through the years of elementary school and asking them what they know about Israel through the use of uh, music and uh, pictures and uh, both direct and indirect questions um, and really help to paint a picture of the internal workings of kids' minds that help to inform how we should be thinking about Israel education, how we should be thinking about talking to Israel, about Israel with our kids. Um, and I know that in the last few weeks, Sivan has been uh, speaking with many groups of parents, with teachers, and even with kids, uh, and helping them through this period. Uh, you know, she was doing this work even before that, but she's been really been in overdrive over the last few weeks. And I've heard from so many people about what an impact she has had on this conversation. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it's just such a wonderful and obvious example. I mean, unfortunate, obviously, that we're living through these these times, but um, but thank goodness that we have people like Sivan um, who can help us think about this. Yeah, thanks for that example. Um, I, I think about the value of Sivan's work, uh, you know, in multiple levels. One One is how seriously she takes kids thinking. Um, and and in this in this regard, I, I it's hard for me not to think about Ziva's work as well. Hopefully, we'll hear about that um, uh, in a little bit. Um, but the other the other thing about the um, the impact of the work is I think about about Sivan's work as sort of basic research. In other words, she didn't start out by saying, you know, what's the best way to teach Israel or what's happening, you know, in the classroom or how can we test a curriculum or something like that. She she started out by just asking, how can we understand how kids think about this really important topic? Because if we don't understand that, and in fact, until she helped us, we we had misconceptions. If we don't understand that, then all of the kinds of interventions that we imagine and and then try and enact, um, we're we're kind of flying blind without without that deep understanding. Great, thanks. Others, Sharon, you want to jump in? You're muted, Sharon. I just wanted to say quickly, since you asked, how does research, what kind of contribution does it make? I would say that Sivan's work is a good example of research that challenges assumptions, that gives us new ways of thinking, and even her modes of inquiry have given people ideas for really how, how to talk, how to frame questions. So just to even be more concrete about um, what research can do. I think about... Um, Another example, I think of a program of research that's been impactful um, on practice, on the practice of Jewish education is the uh, groundbreaking work on text, text study in Hevruta that Ellie Holzer and Orit Kent did here at the center in the context of the DELIT program and have continued to do over the last decade or so. Um, this is research close-up studies. It began as close-up studies of of um, partners engaged in text study, and it's sort of branched out to be a much broader um, model of, of partnership teaching and learning. I think they've produced what I would call conceptual tools, big ideas, like the idea that text study in Chavruta is really a process 
with three partners, not just two partners, the text and the two people, all of whom have to be listened to, all of whom have to give voice. And they've also, from their work, generated a whole set of pedagogical strategies and tools for helping learners uh, develop the skills to engage in a kind of ethical, respectful, um, empowered learning uh, with others. And this work has been um, taught to young children, to, to young adults, to teachers um, in lots of settings. And now I think the work is um, really taking off through its support in Hadar as uh, Allison Cook, along with Orid, are bringing the pedagogy of partnership to teachers and schools around the country. So that to me is a good example of research that began also in a very basic way and has now generated um, ideas and tools that can transform the quality of, of teaching and learning. Yeah. So, um, and one, thank you, Sean. And, and uh, just to, to emphasize that the program that's now called Pedagogy of Partnership, um, based at based at Hadar, that's a that's a um, it's an innovative, serious um, effort to do professional development in the field that draws on all of the this important scholarship that really that brings that scholarship to um, to the work of professional development. Um, I'll toss in, um, I'm going to toss in two examples. I'll break the the um, the rules a little bit. Um, but the examples are linked um, in my mind. The two examples that I want to mention are um, the Hebrew Infusion book, a book about Hebrew in American Jewish summer camps. And uh, Jonathan Krasner was one of the co-authors, along with our, our, our colleagues, um, Sharon Avni and, and Sarah Benor. Um, and a little bit, uh, a little bit older is Shaul Kellner's book on um, on birthright. Um, and the reason I'm I'm connecting the two of them is that uh, I think both of them are exquisite examples of a kind of um, of an ethnographic mode. In other words, rather than asking, you know, is this uh, is this a good educational institution? Is this a good educational program? Is this a good intervention? Is this a good camp? Is this a good trip? Is it accomplishing uh, some other outcomes? They, they, they hold those questions and they, they just ask what's, what's going on here? What is it that, that if I, if I pay really close attention and I observe what, what can I learn about what's happening here, whether that's on a birthright bus um, or in American Jewish summer camps. And, and in fact, one of the things um, that we um, that we learned from the book about uh, Hebrew and camp is that there's there's something happening in American Jewish summer camps around Hebrew that has nothing to do with, in most cases, has nothing to do with Hebrew fluency as we typically imagine it. It there's something there's other important linguistic work um, that's happening which we would only know about um, if or we we only know about it when we take the time slow down and observe and and ask the question of what's happening. Is so I want to yeah, I want to jump in. So the Hebrew infusion book um by Sarah Benor and, and of course Jonathan Krasner who's here with us and Sharon Avney was really paradigm shifting and and all of um Sharon Avney's work on sociolinguistics and how that how that gives us a lens for understanding Hebrew education was just profoundly um, paradigm shifting, both in how we think, but I think also in how now professional development at Hebrew at the Center and the work that Vardit Rheingold is doing with teachers in saying that like students' motivation for learning a language is not is not an afterthought, but is actually uh, the primary um, piece of the puzzle that we need to interrogate and investigate and understand that that if it that if a student wants to be part of this culture if a student wants to speak this language that's going to impact really how they how they actually uh how they actually adapt the language to themselves and and which community that they want to be a part of and what the the Hebrew infusion book did so beautifully was reminded us that um there are other 
there are other dialects that include Hebrew. They call, you know, Hebrew infused English um, that reflect communities that might be really important to to join, to want to show that you are part of. And so that just flipped on on its head the entire deficit perspective that we take towards Hebrew education. Kids don't. And and, and I say that because I actually just had this conversation with um, scholars who do literacy and, and, and multilingualism, and they really pushed me. They said, what's your story, Ziva? I was like, what do you mean my story? Um, and they're like, well, you don't do research unless you have a story at the bottom of it. And so I uh, it just it caused me, you know, in this room of people who are studying Spanish and French and 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 no one else is studying Hebrew in that room to think about like, well, what's my story? What did Hebrew infusion do for me personally? And what it did for me is it reminded me that perhaps my leaving day school without perfect fluency in Hebrew is not only, of course, it's a reflection of my own failings, but it's not only a reflection <laughs> of my own failings, but it's also a reflection of who I was when I was 12 years old, who I was when I was 10 years old, 14 year old, and what communities and language communities I wanted to join. And I think that that book was the first book that really uh, put that idea forward. Nice. Great. I want to move on. Um, The next... um. The next question I want to pose, I, I want to ask uh, each of you to be a little less modest. So rather than thinking about other people's scholarship, now I want to ask you about um, your own scholarship. And uh, I want to put you on the spot and ask you about a con not not your entire uh, not not your entire CV, but a contribution that you think you've made. Um, so share with us one one piece of scholarship that that you think um, has made a difference. Joe, would you start the, start us off? Thank you, John. Sure, pleasure. Um, yes, let me talk a little bit about my book on Jewish summer camps called Making Shabbat, um, which university came out with Brandeis University Press a year ago. Um, you know, so much of the scholarship on camp is practical. Um, and where it veers into the experience of kids, it focuses primarily on kids having fun with friends. And that's crucial for understanding camp, but it misses so much. And I thought a, a way at getting at what that research misses is by studying Shabbat. You know, it's a commonplace that Shabbat at Jewish summer camps is a real highlight for the summer and that both staff and kids really get a lot out of celebrating Shabbat on a weekly basis. But the question that I posed is both what goes into making that possible and what do campers learn from celebrating Shabbat at camp? Um, I tried to bring together um, a sense of shared joy and celebration with a sense of learning. And learning here, of course, isn't the kind of learning that often takes place in classrooms, um, it's a different kind of learning. It's, it's a kind of learning that we all are familiar with, um, but that we don't often think about as learning, which is the learning that we do together when we celebrate together. And again, I won't go on for too long, um, but I, I really want to bring celebration and learning together because that's been very powerful in Jewish summer camps but it could be powerful in many other Jewish contexts as well if we were to explore that more deeply. So thanks for asking, John. Of course, that's great. That's great. Um, Sharon, can I turn to you? But one, sure. tell us about one, uh, one, sure. one, one contribution. Sure. So I think, um, well, I'll start with a more general point, which is I feel like in in Jewish education, I've been trying to challenge a widespread view not only in Jewish education, but um, that good teachers are born, not made. And uh, I've been trying to promote the idea that teaching is a complex practice that needs to be learned and can be taught. So um, over the years, I had the wonderful opportunity to design a number of programs that served as laboratories for studying what it takes to help teachers at different career stages learn what they need to know and be able to do. And one example is, is a comparative study that I did a number of years ago, um, which was came out in a book called um, Preparing Teachers for Mission-Driven Schools. It was a comparison of um, program that was preparing day school teachers, Catholic teachers, and teachers for urban public schools. And in that, in that 
book and through that research, I was trying to make a strong case for the variety of things that prospective teachers need to learn if they're going to be effective and committed Jewish day school teachers, sort of the combination of pedagogical requirements, identity development. Um, we had a particular vision in the DELED program of general studies teachers who saw themselves as Jewish educators. So how do you take people whose subject matters are not rooted in Jewish tradition, but who still through the way in which they teach and the way in which they think about themselves as, um, as teachers is part of the Jewish education of the school. And I think that theme of, of um, identity development in the context of developing your practice um, was a cross-cutting theme in that work. And, and it, I, it, it came through at a time. I, mean, I think there have not been, uh, has not been historically a serious commitment to teacher preparation in Jewish education. It's just not a phenomenon that um, the field has embraced. Right. right. Sharon, I remember, um, I know this is probably 15 or 20 years ago already, but I remember talking to a philanthropist who said to me, um, you know, we, we just, we just need, um, we just need young people who, who know a lot and who are passionate. That that's all we need. And I remember thinking, no, I, I, I think there's a lot more and <laughs> it's actually really hard work. We need to really understand how people learn this work and how they develop over time in the trajectory of learning of learning this work of teaching or of being educators in in whatever um in whatever setting and that's that's what i learned from you sharon from um from lots of years of uh of working closely together um jonathan yeah so i'm actually going to choose an article that i wrote um and i think a lot of times uh when a scholar academic writes an article uh or a book um I mean, I guess there are times when people just know that it's going to cause a splash. Um, but there are other times where you may be as surprised as anybody else that something like really takes off. And that was certainly the case with a little article that I wrote um, called The Place of Tikkun Olam in American Jewish Life. Um, this was an article that I wrote as an intervention uh, into what I felt in the you know, the mid 2000s was a discourse that had become highly politicized. The term tikkun olam um, had really, on the one hand, it had become gospel for some Jews and it was like radioactive for other Jews. Uh, and I wanted to historicize it. Um, I wanted, on the one hand, for people to understand that uh, if you would go back in a time machine uh, and, you know, go back a hundred years that if you said tikkun olam, that like people would look at you like you had uh, horns that, you know, nobody would understand what that was. Uh, so just the, the notion that this isn't something that has always been with us, this, this term. Um, but I also wanted us to think about language and to think about the uh, way in which language evolves um, and to, maybe break this sort of um, way of thinking, which I, I guess, which, which suggests that there is a right answer and a wrong answer or a right way to think about what a term means in a wrong way or a more authentic way. Um, and with tikkun olam, as it turns out, um, for those who are familiar with classical texts, you know, we do have the term tikkun olam uh, in the uh in the Talmud we have it in uh we have it in uh mystical literature um and in fact that term has evolved even within the classical literature and then when we get to the 20th century we have events like the Holocaust um and uh we have the 1960s and the search for relevance um and and the impact of identity studies um, that really helped to shape the way in which this term has taken on its present meaning. Uh, and so I hope that what the article does is it demystifies this term a little bit um, and helps us think a little bit more clearly, 
maybe lower the temperature a little bit, um, but also challenge people to think a little bit about, you know, what this term means, how we deploy it. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and I, it yeah. certainly has, seems to have had an impact because um, it's one of the articles that I wrote that is most cited. So yeah, it is most cited. And and Jonathan, as I've told you, I use it in my um, in my own teaching about Tikkun Olam, um, and it's it's enormously helpful. Um, and uh, I, I want to uh, build on what you said, Jonathan, um, before turning to to Ziva. Um, Jonathan, you're you're a historian. I'm a philosopher. We you know we approach the questions that we think about with using different methodologies. But in this respect, I, there there's something that we do that's similar, which is to say, um, we often think about the language that we use, especially especially language that's related to to uh, a, a important value or important desired outcome in Jewish education. Your name is Tikkun Olam. The one I, I will turn to is Jewish identity, and um, uh, as you know, Jonathan, because you you actually had a chapter in the book, um, we uh, we had a project uh, focused on um, rethinking Jewish identity and and challenging um, assumptions about what Jewish identity means, and especially a kind of a casual use of the the idea of Jewish identity as as an outcome uh, of Jewish education. Um, I did this. We convened a conference. I did this work with our colleague uh, Ari Kalman, and we wrote uh, an edited volume um, called "Beyond Jewish Identity." And um, and like you, Jonathan, I I continue to hear from um, colleagues in the field of practice who who come across the work in various ways, and who share with me that it was it was clarifying for them it was helpful for them to think through some of the language that they use perhaps unreflectively um not because we're we're canceling jewish identity not because we're getting rid of the language or forbidding it or anything we're not policing language but we are asking by providing either historical context or some conceptual context we're trying to help all of us think more deeply, especially about um, about our values and about our, our desired outcomes. Um, Ziva, over to you. What's an example? Okay, sure. Um, so my example is my forthcoming book, The Second Conversation, Interpretive Authority in the Bible Classroom. And particularly, uh, I'll tell the contribution, but what I'm proud of is it really builds on um, all the work that Sharon has done and, and has taught me in the sense that after going to graduate school and getting my doctorate at Stanford, I had learned all of these new theories about uh, textual meaning and pedagogy. And I had this impulse, um, okay, time to try them. And supported by the Edinburgh grant um, from the Network of Research in Jewish Education, I was actually able during my postdoc to to go it turns out it's not that hard to get a job teaching middle school Tanakh um, <laughs> it's a tough job and so uh, a local school gave me the job for two years and I brought a research assistant at camera and did all of the um, the data collection that goes into teacher research to really explore my dilemmas of practice around wanting to create an interpretive community for my students that felt meaningful for everyone in my class and what I want to highlight today is just like how pervasive the feeling of or the lack of feeling of meaning is in school. Right. So, for example, you know, this is one of the easiest times of year because we're in the narrative parts of Torah and the weekly Parsha. And so it's it's pretty low hanging fruit on Shabbat to go up to a kid and say, hey, what did you learn in Parsha class? Because even if they weren't paying attention once they know what the story is, they have something there. But I, I had this experience. I was, I shouldn't call out the town, uh, but I was visiting cousins and they were cousins from somewhere else. And I said, what did you learn in Parsha class? She said, I don't know. I spaced out all day. <laughs> you know, her mom quickly covered. But <laughs> for me as an educational researcher, I was like, that's real. Like kids space out. And I actually can tell you why they space out. They space out because it's not clear to them what's happening in the classroom and what and whether it matters whether they participate or not. And so what this work and this uh, book explores is how do you create a community of practice where the students know the expectations and can feel ownership over the interpretive expectations, the community expectations, the talk expectations around interpretation, such that there's no option of spacing out because you really feel, or at least if you do choose to space out, you get that that's a real loss to the interpretive community. And um, that's much harder 
to do than we might think going full circle back to Sharon's work about how difficult it is to truly learn how to teach. Um, thank you, Ziva. And I, I want to emphasize, um, you know, when the book is out, we'll have the opportunity to we'll do a book launch. Um, hopefully lots of people will be able to uh, read it and 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 learn about the work. Um, but one of the um, and party with us. We should mention we also we don't just write. We also we also celebrate. Right. Joe was talking about <laughs> celebration. So we also have to make sure we're celebrating. Um, uh, and um, and one of the really elegant things about the book, Ziva, is that um, you're very open about the teaching challenges. So this is not, you know, a how to book just, you know, everybody should do what you did um, and everything will be fine. Um, it's it's much more nuanced than that. It's much more um, vulnerable than that because you're really walking through like, here are some of the things that we encountered. I thought it was going to go this way. And in fact, it didn't actually go quite quite that way, which, you know, a person might say, well, how is that helpful to um, to an educator? The educator needs to be told what to do. But I think there's an argument. Would you t tell us a little bit more? Why? Why is it helpful to an educator not to be told? Why do what we to do? not? Why can't we uh, script all of education? Exactly. Such that, exactly. Wouldn't that be uh, easy? We could teacher proof it because yeah. it's relational. That uh -huh. that's the and uh, we haven't talked about the sort of work and um, I know that social emotional is not like learning is actually a little bit not the term we want to be using right now. But the work is relational. There is no scripting. I mean. And and so that's sort of that's the foundation of the research that all of us do. There is no scripting, but there is deep thinking mm -hmm. and there is uh, ways of of looking at problems and thinking about problems. And so um, certainly my book doesn't offer a script, but it offers some very helpful ways for teachers to think about how to do meaningful uh, discussion of text in their classroom, both in their Tanakh classroom or any other text classroom. I want to offer a different answer to your question that, um, yes, teaching is relational and teachers build relationships both with students and among students and with content. But teaching is also a complex What part of what makes teaching hard is that it's an uncertain practice. And one of the reasons why you can't develop a script is if you take kids ideas seriously which Ziva does in her teaching and which her pedagogy is really trying to highlight, you don't know what kids are going to say. So you can't prepare ahead of time what your response is going to be. Part of what's challenging about a kind of teaching that takes kids' ideas seriously, and I think this is a link with Sivan's work who helps us get an insight, sheds a light on how kids think and their capacity to think at young ages about complex problems. Um, so both Ziva and, and Sivan do this is that teachers, besides there are certainly routine aspects to teaching, but a lot of the teaching that centers on kids thinking requires you to think on your feet, to listen carefully and figure out how to extend kids ideas or uncover them or clarify them in the moment. And that's part of what makes if you're not going to do stand and deliver teaching, if you're going to do the kind of teaching that Ziva is trying to enact and take ideas that kids have seriously, that Sivan is saying, then you have the challenge of figuring out improvisationally in the moment what's an educative response to the things that kids say that you can't anticipate. Beautiful. So that, Beautiful. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask uh, each of you to think about other ways that your scholarship um, has made a difference, especially through the ki other kinds of work um, that you've been involved with. But before we get to that, I, I actually want to share a question that's popped up in the in the Q&A, which is about um, what scholarship in Jewish education might actually have to teach. Um, the broader field of um, of education, uh, of public development, whether that's in public schools or uh, any other any other kind of educational setting, um, uh, I'm curious whether you have thoughts about that. Ziva, do you wanna? Sure. I mean, one like the only people who ask that question is people in Jewish education. So that's like the first reassuring thing. Like when I go to conferences and 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 education and literacy, that like they're so interested in our work um, because they understand that we're a case 
And um, we're a case of a few different things. We're a case, as I spoke uh, with Jonathan and uh, Sarah Benoit and Sharon Avney's book, we're a case of language education. We're a case of values education. We're a case of intensive text study. I mean, uh, maybe there's a unit in in general studies classrooms in public schools. I'm talking in elementary school that really dives deep into a text, but maybe not. And yet we are doing that uh, at least from second grade on in so much as we are really looking at uh, both Mishnaic and biblical texts with these students. And so um, some of the dynamics that we look at, particularly around um particularly around, I, I could keep going with the list, but I'll stop here. Let me just focus on my work around how you teach students to talk about text. That is a big, big question that a lot of people are wondering about because how we talk about text in the classroom, we're spending our whole lives talking about text, right? Sometimes we use it as, uh, we, we use it in a somewhat um, commodified sense of like, oh, look, here's a proof text for what I think. And here's a proof text. But when we get really invested in something, we look at the words of the text. And so to train students and how do you have that conversation? How do you how do you not let it um, let it explode, but actually stay on the words of the text, even as someone saying something is deeply painful or offensive to you? Uh, these are skills that the world wants to know about. And these are skills that we sort of take for granted. And thank you, Zeeva. And I just, just want to kind of emphasize that um, what I hear you talking about is, to my mind, has to do with a kind of um, an, a pedagogic moment of, of slowing things down, of paying closer attention, of being, uh, you use the word commodified, right? Of being less less of an effort to try and um, be transactional with with the text. What can I squeeze out of this? And, and what information do I have to learn and then move on to the next thing? Um, and to the extent that Jewish educational settings can be spaces for that slower and more deliberative work, um, which is feels so, so countercultural every every day, every moment, it, it becomes more and more countercultural. It feels that much more important and, and perhaps something that we can share with others. Jonathan, yeah, did you want, want to piggyback? In? I just want to piggyback on what Ziva was saying from, uh, you know, you thinking about this from using historical methodology. Comparative case studies really shed so much light on, uh, you know, on on the on the way in which processes um, play themselves out. I mean, I'll just give you one example of this from my own work. Um, before I started writing my book, The Benderly Boys in American Jewish Education, there was a fair amount of work in education more generally, history of education more generally on the progressive era and on the impact of Dewey on schools um, and particularly on the failure of reform in the, you know, the, the early 20th century. Um, but most of that was focused either on public schools or was focused on Dewey's own school um, in Chicago. Um, and I think that by looking at the impact that Dewey had on Jewish educators and the dilemmas that they faced trying on the one hand to enact educational reforms that they knew in their hearts were the right way to teach kids, but at the same time contending with all of these other environmental uh, pressures, whether it was pressure from parents for kids to be able to read Hebrew um, or whether it was pressure from schools um, or from society about what a school should look like, what um, you know, what what Tayak and Cuban call uh, you know the uh, the grammar of schooling, that a school should look the way that basically a public school looks like, um, that all of these things had an impact, and I think that by looking at the Jewish case study in a way, it sheds light on a larger phenomenon um, that, uh, you know, that that was was uh, taking place at that particular period of time. Great. Thank you. Those are those are excellent answers. And I know we could we could talk more about um, in response to that good question from from the audience. I want to turn to this question about um, kind of the modes of impact or the, the channels of impact, because you know, there's, there's an obvious way that we think about how scholarship has an impact, which is 
there's there's good scholarship that's done. It's shared out with it, with the world. You know, I sometimes say that the business model of the Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education is to develop ideas and give them away for free, right? That's actually what what we want is other people to to encounter ideas and use them. Um, and that's a that's an kind of the main main direction. But it's also the case that that each of us are deeply involved in in the fields of practice. Um, in various kinds of, of educational projects, in, in various roles. And so I would love to hear more about that to help all of us think about kind of that avenue of how scholarship um, affects practice. Joe, would you would you kick us off? Sure, John. In, in my case, in, in uh, researching Making Shabbat, the book about Shabbat at Jewish summer camps, I had the unusual and very beneficial possibility of working through the FJC, the Foundation for Jewish Camp, as a consultant to a variety of Jewish residential camps that were working on enhancing Jewish practice at their camps. And numbers of those camps focused on Shabbat as the example of what they wanted to enhance. And that partnership where I was able to bring my scholarship, but they were able to provide me with very real and candid dilemmas that they were facing and how to make Shabbat celebration more lively, more engaging um, for their campers and for their staff, um, that really opened my eyes. Um, I'll just give you one example because it's so unusual. I was working with one camp out West where about half their staff is not Jewish. And so for the first time in my whole life, um, but I think this is much more common, I had to think about the question of, so what does Shabbat mean to non-Jewish staff members who are part of the celebration? Um, and that was just a fascinating question. It's not reflected very much in my book, but that's the wonderful thing about doing consulting while you're doing research, that the consulting itself, its realness, um, opens your eyes and opens your mind to possibilities that you yourself have never even considered. Um, so that partnership um, with FJC was, was such a wonderful springboard to being able to write about Shabbat account. That's that's beautiful, Joe. And one of the things that strikes me about that example is um, they the, these practitioners, the, the these camp leaders, were sharing a problem or practice with you in other words they were they were seeking guidance some somehow they felt that things weren't what they wanted them to be um but on the other hand they weren't necessarily looking for as we were talking before looking for a script looking for the one right answer they were looking for a thought partner um to help perhaps somebody who has seen a lot of different camps who has thought about this field who knows something about the history of the development who can actually help them think through their um, their options in a way that you know if you didn't have all of that scholarly patient scholarly work kind of built up you would not have been able to you would not have been able to do so it was like exactly. a fortuitous marriage right, right. and <laughs> as my colleagues have said scripts are very little value models are helpful uh, ideas are helpful scripts no they don't work. <laughs> Each camp is different. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Um, Ziva, tell us, uh, give us an example of how you've been able to work with practitioners. Um, yeah, so I started a new project that was focused on what focused on biblical Hebrew and biblical Hebrew uh, comprehension. And so in order, and I did this project with my scroll lab that we have at the center, uh, which is an education lab focused on undergraduate students to sort of uh, allow them to participate in the culture and practice of, of research. And the first thing that I did was I uh, convened a group of teachers to be my advisory board in thinking through these questions of, well, I have a lot of questions about how and what students know but you all have been in the classroom. I, I picked, you know, uh, very experienced teachers, teachers who had been in the classroom for at least 10 years and really in the classroom. Um, obviously they had moved into administrative roles, but they spent the majority of their time teaching. 
And this was just a fascinating, it didn't end in the summer. Of course, the work we did, uh, like Joe said, um, it, 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 it just sort of pours out. And so they helped me think of my research agenda, but, uh, but then our conversations continue. We were featured on Prisma together. Uh, they showed me everything they were doing in their class. They were department chairs, so it influenced what their entire team was doing. And this is a just really conversations about what is reasonable to expect as far as what um, elementary school, middle school students might be able to understand about the structure of a language. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a lot of fun and it was very organic. I was really trying to get something from them, not um, not allow for the work to to emanate out, but it did. Yeah. Great. Um, so again, it, similar to to Joe's example, there's a real there's a real partnership, um, uh, which allows you to bring expertise in conversation with um, with colleagues in the field. Um, Jonathan, what's your example? You're muted still. Sorry about that. Um, even after all of these years post COVID, <laughs> we still make this mistake. Um, so. Yeah, so I've so thank goodness I've had opportunities as well to bring what I've learned, uh, particularly about the way in which um, young people, students of all ages, actually um, think and think about history, uh, history education, Jewish history. I'm thinking particularly of how my colleague Ben Jacobs and I work every year with a group of teachers at the National Educators Institute at the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History. And each uh, of our uh, students uh, who are faculty members at, at day schools and at, at re in religious schools across the country um, come with a particular project that they're working on, a curricular project. Um, and it's been very rewarding to help them to think about how to do that work. But I also want to use a counter example, um, an example or a, a lesson in humility that I learned. Um, I wrote a dissertation all about textbooks and about the representation of insiders and outsiders in textbooks. And I thought when I finished this dissertation that I knew everything that was wrong about the textbook industry and the way in which textbooks were written. And um, lo and behold, I, I think serendipitously, um, it turned out that you know shortly after I published my dissertation that um, Behrman House, uh, a, a big publisher in the Jewish world, um, was looking for uh, someone to write a textbook for middle school students on Jewish history. And they turned to myself and Jonathan Sarna. And I was adamant about how we weren't going to make all of these mistakes. And I do think that the textbook, I mean, you know, to whatever, and all modesty aside, I do think that it is a good textbook. But what I learned in the process that is how important structural considerations are mm -hmm. in the way in which this particular industry operates from the number of lessons to the number of pages for each lesson uh, to uh, visuals and the kinds of questions that are placed at the end of the chapters, which, you know, I, I fought with, uh, with them about making sure they weren't regurgitation questions, but all of these issues that I thought would be so easy to solve, it turns out that, uh, you know, I, I guess I don't have a business cup because I never really thought about it from that perspective of, guess what? There are 24 weeks of school. So you have to have 24 chapters in the book, you know, um, something as simple as that. So, yeah. All right. Well, I guess the, the next uh, the next textbook you write will be easier, right, Jonathan? <laughs> Sharon, what's your example? Well, I I could not do my scholarship on how people learn to teach and get better at teaching over time without working closely and directly with teachers at every stage in their career. And um, in my work in Jewish education, I've had the wonderful opportunity to uh, create such programs 
and have them function as laboratories for this ongoing research, both a program for prospective teachers, the Dellet program, a program for beginning day school teachers. We had an induction project at the center for eight or so years in which we tried to understand what it would take to create a culture of, of support and learning for beginning teachers. Um, many people assume that once you hire you hire a beginning teacher, they know what they're doing. Yes, they might need some orientation to the school, but with a little bit of support and sort of help in learning the ropes, they're on their way. And, and this is far from the truth. Beginning teachers are really learning to teach in the context of teaching and need a lot more than just an assigned mentor. So we worked hard with um, eight local day schools to try to figure out what it would take to create the conditions and capacities for schools to really grow new teachers. And then we took what we learned and shared that. Well, we had sort of teams of people working with day schools around the country to help um, bring the tools and insights from that research um, to that larger question of how you create a culture of, of uh, teacher learning in a day school, which then can become a foundation for the learning of all teachers. Um, and there are models of research. Design research really allows people to do direct work with the field and to use that work as a, as a source of insights for sort of continued improvement of practice, direct improvement of practice. So that has been a a mode of scholarship, not the only, but one mode of scholarship that I have found very compatible. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And generative. Um, thank you for sharing that. The, the example that I'll toss in is um, is the work that I did um, as a contributor to the Standards and Benchmarks project that was run out of um, out of JTS for many years. Um, and um, and this was in, uh, several years back when I was doing a lot more work around um, the teaching and learning of of classical Jewish texts, Tanakh, and and, and rabbinic literature. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity because it was a, a a project that was really trying to develop some shared understanding about kind of the the uh, and a diverse understanding of um, of the goals of uh, of teaching in these domains and um and also what what would some uh standards and benchmarks along along the learning trajectory look like um like jonathan it was it was really challenging to take some of the um some of the more abstract ideas that i had developed um in in some of my scholarship and and really work together with with really smart practitioners and to to develop uh those um i do think that it was it was great work and it was a wonderful learning experience for me as well, and I hope that I did contribute. Um, and also, like Jonathan, I think that there is a kind of a cautionary tale. But in, in my case, it's not so much about um, textbook development, but it's more about um, how hard it is to um, to implement um, curricular change and pedagogic change in institutions and how much support that takes um, and how, and I'm, I'm going to say something which uh is 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 going to be critical of the Jewish community how often we try and kind of short circuit or 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 kind of try and do it on the cheap and um and I just don't think that real good work happens on on the cheap I sometimes my analogy is that um you know in the field of math education there are hundreds of scholars and dozens of journals and just this flourishing ecosystem and within that ecosystem the national council of teacher mathematics develops their standards and that lives within that large ecosystem including a large large research um uh, infrastructure and and when it comes to the teaching of jewish studies we try to just short circuit all of that and just kind of generate the standards and benchmarks quickly and get them out. And I do think it was good work. And I know that it's been helpful for lots of practitioners, but it also, for me, serves as a kind of cautionary tale. You can't, it, you just can't do this work on the cheap. You really need to build out that, um, that intellectual infrastructure. Sharon, do you want to respond? Well, and capacity, when you say how hard it is to implement new curriculum, we have under, not fully understood the place of teacher learning 
you know, teachers have to unlearn what they've been doing and learn new ways of working with kids or learn new content, learn new pedagogies. That kind of work takes time. That that um, the under, other side of the curriculum development implementation coin is teacher development. And right. um, if we ignore that process, um, then, you know, the best poor implementation can undermine the best ideas. Yeah. So. There's a question in the in the chat which I want to pose to you, um, and I'm curious uh, what your thinking is. We we know that um, that motivation is enormously important for learning, um, and I'm curious what you might share from your own scholarship or other scholarship um, about how that happens and how we can develop the right kinds of motivation. Do you have thoughts about this? Do you want to start? Please, Joe, go ahead. Oh, Oh, well, okay. Um, Yeah, I mean, you know, learning is a partnership. And part, I think Xavier was talking about this earlier, and and part of what it means to motivate children to learn um, is to create the kind of partnership that on the one hand, you in some ways, you decrease the risk uh, because learning something new is really risky, um, especially if it's something new that matters. Um, and one of the ways of decreasing the risk is for older people and younger people to enter into a partnership where they undertake the learning together. Um, and they undertake the learning together in a way that the older person or the more experienced person um, helps to, in a sense, hold the less experienced person as that less experienced person is taking his or her first steps into this new domain. Um, And again, Sharon mentioned Hevruta as a really good example of, sometimes it doesn't have to be an adult and a child, sometimes it can just be more experienced peer working with another peer. Um, But the beauty of it is trying to understand how you create the social support that allows new learning to take place. Um, And uh, if if those social supports aren't present, and here it doesn't matter what we're talking about, classrooms or camps or whatever context, um, then many, many more people are not going to be, quote, motivated to do that learning because motivation isn't just something inside people. Motivation is also something that's social, that's created between people. And we really need to pay attention both to what's in the person, but even more importantly, what's between the persons who are involved in the learning situation. That's something I also want to lift up what you said about if we're learning something that matters. I also think that motivation is enhanced when learners are le- having opportunities to learn things that matter, that matter to them, that are really um, important. And so I think that that's another, you know, there's not one simple, um, you're talking about the social, the scaffolding and the relational supports that motivate learning. But I also think people are motivated to learn things they care about. And I think we have to ensure that the things that we're teaching and we create opportunities to be learned are things that matter. So I'll add, I'll add an, a, a, another element. So when we imagine kind of the, the responsibility, the awesome responsibility that educators have to create the environments, the, the, the containers for those kinds of trusting relationships, and we imagine like, how do we, how do we find those locations to, to um, where where students or or uh, participants in a program can work on something that matters, um, and and then how do we challenge them? I think those those things are kind of necessary. Um, without without those things to to challenge um, to challenge students without the trusting environment and without the sense that we're working on something that matters um, w- won't work. Um, and but when we do have trusting social environment, and when we do have a sense that we're working on something important, then we have the capacity to say, okay, well now we're actually we may work on something that's hard, 
we may actually, this, this may be challenging material, or it may be challenged to preconceptions that we want to, that we want to interrogate. Um, and I'll share, I'm thinking about this just because of uh, a dinner I had literally last night with my students. And um, the, the most beautiful thing the students said at this dinner, um, I apologize if it sounds like it's, it's, um, uh, if, it, if it doesn't sound Sounds a little arrogant, but the most beautiful thing that the students said was that um, in this classroom, they felt comfortable to re-examine their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that is, I, uh, that makes me really, really happy. If, you know, if something went right in this classroom that they could actually re-examine something that they came in with, um, then, then something good, that was something good. Um, I want to turn to, uh, keeping an eye on the clock, I want to turn to um, a next question about um, maybe what's missing when you think about the field of uh, scholarship in Jewish education. What do you wish there were more of? Joe, do you have a thought about that? I do. Um, you know, I spent uh, another consulting job I had was uh, with the Nachshon Project. And the Nachshon Project is dedicated to trying to build a kind of ladder up towards Jewish professional life. And um, the base of that ladder happened to be um, Jewish summer camps. That's how I got involved. Um, and staff at Jewish summer camps. And what we learned is the staff at Jewish summer camps is, are an enormous resource to the future of Judaism in America. But you know, it's really interesting. Different summer camps, and this may be true for different Hillels or different universities, um, different summer camps have very different records in how much they promote um, the kind of what I'll call Jewish ascension of their staff, the degree to which um, a camp helps to inspire their staff members, not just to do the job in the present, um, but to actually think about the job they're doing in the present as a kind of stepping stone towards future Jewish involvements. And so um, I don't know any, I know plenty of research on staff at camp, but I don't know any research that actually looks at this question, this question of what can happen at a Jewish summer camp that implants in many of the members of their staff this question or this wish, how can I continue to grow Jewishly? Whether that continued growth is professional or personal um, or communal, um, that's a very important question. And I don't know anyone who has researched that. So I wish that would become a research project. Joe, it reminds me of a, of a line in Dewey, um, and I'm, I won't get the words exactly right, but he says something like, um, the, the most important collateral learning is uh, in any in any setting is the the desire to continue oh, to learn the desire to grow um, and when we we create environments that we cultivate that particular disposition then you know then the sky's the limit um Sharon did you want to jump in on this question I think um, a, a kind of research that I wish we had more of um, is research that tries to link um, the features of, let's say, serious professional development with the kinds of learning outcomes. Like I think we have, um, we sort of treated programs like that as black boxes and we've studied inputs and we've studied outcomes, but we really haven't um, and this is also in general education, a direction that the field of research and professional development is, is heading to try to understand better the relationship between particular elements or aspects of, of a design and its effects on people's practice, on their satisfaction, on their retention, what, whatever the outcomes are that um, we're trying to promote. So I feel like that kind of close-up study would illuminate the work itself in ways that that would be very helpful right and we would uh, just we to would sort of go iterate. off of to go off of that for a second i think that in general our field needs to think about applied studies in a much broader way 
than it currently does. I think that a lot of what is produced now are impact studies. And I completely understand why people do impact studies, particularly in an age of mega donor giving. People want to know that their money is having an impact, that, you know, the programs that are being created are, um, you know, uh, touching people, um, even though they probably also know that um, people lie with statistics all the time. So I think you should be a little bit careful about, you know, especially when you have a, you know, a, a firm that uh, is uh, perhaps uh, has a vested interest in telling you what you want to hear already. But more importantly, I think that we should think about applied, you know, a, applied studies in a much broader way. I think about Laura Yaris's new book um, mm -hmm. on Jewish Sunday schools. And, you know, she was telling me that a lot of people, when they hear that she was writing the book or after she uh, published the book, they, they asked her, well, do they work or don't they work? You know, um, and she said, that's exactly the wrong question to ask. That is the least interesting question. Um, why don't we talk about the feminization of the profession of Jewish education, which she documents in that book um, and the implications of that, or how in the 19th century, Jewish educators were mostly volunteers um, as opposed to professionals. And what is the, um, you know, how, how that paradigm shift from a voluntary workforce to a professional workforce had an influence on the field. There are so many interesting questions that you can ask if you get beyond the the reductive, does it work or doesn't it work, right? Yeah. So Jonathan, I just want to emphasize that, uh, and I, I completely agree with you, that there's a kind of, um, those those two little words, what works, um, ha they, they can be really toxic because they they can sh kind of narrow our focus and um, and our understanding of of the important phenomena. And what you're saying is not that we should just have a bunch of um, uh, you know ivory tower scholarship that doesn't have an influence of practice. What you're actually saying is no. There's a much deeper way that scholarship actually helps. And what we've been talking about for the, for the last hour, a much deeper set of channels or avenues that scholarship can influence practice that, that are, are much more interesting and also much more impactful than just the question of, did that particular program work or not? Ziva, did think, you want to jump in? Go ahead, Sharon, then I'll Well, I just think we should mention um, the, the book that um, Alex Thompson and Jack Wertheimer um, recently published with our, our new series of books in Jewish education um, called Inside Jewish Day Schools. I think it's that's an example. There's sort of um, cases of ethnographic portraits of nine different day schools, and it's not do they work, but how they work and why they work and, and how they offer us visions of the possible in very diverse kinds of contexts, what day school education could look like and what makes it um, function the way that it functions in these different settings. So I think that's another example of a, of a kind of scholarship that we need more of. Wonderful. So I'm going to um, I'm going to move us keeping an eye on the clock. We only have a few minutes left. I'm going to move us to my last question. And I'm going to unfortunately ask each of each of you to, to chime in. But but very briefly, um, looking forward, what's what's the most uh, important scholarly project that you're you're working on right now? And um, and why do you feel that it's um, that it's important for Jewish education? I'll I'll share first just briefly. Um, the last couple of years, I've been trying to understand how we talk about uh, Jewish literacy and Jewish illiteracy. Um, we want literacy. It's a good thing. But we we sometimes fall into a trap um, in thinking about um, literacy as kind of piling up information in, in students' heads. And what I'm hoping to do, it, have started to publish and, and hoping to do in the book project is to challenge some of our assumptions about um, first of all, but what Jews do and don't know, and also how we think about what they ought to know, and then to um, to develop a kind of a, a better, stronger, deeper conceptualization of, of Jewish literacy. Um, Ziva, tell us about your upcoming work. Sure. So um, 
again, with my undergraduate students in Squirrel Lab, we've been doing this work uh, where we, for two years on a regular basis, sat and did task-based interviews uh, with a protocol that we created ourselves to uh, um, understand how students translate biblical Hebrew and perhaps more importantly, what resources they bring to that task. So as uh, as we piloted the protocol and continued to improve it, we got to questions like, um, what helped you figure that out? What, um, how did you know that? And it was those questions that really offered us incredible insights. And I think that in a moment, um, you know, the Atlantic had an article already five years old, but called the new bilingualism, which is a huge uh, problem in the sense that this is as far as American history, this like the fact that in upper middle class uh, milieus, now multilingualism has become um, considered really important and uh, has incredible social and cultural capital sort of uh, belies the history of what we've done in education to our multilingual students and our immigrant students. But it does raise the question, Jewish Jewish education doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so uh, is this newfound love of an appreciation for bilingualism, multilingualism, the seal of biliteracy, is that going to have an impact on what we're doing with Hebrew and with uh, Hebrew texts in day school? So that's my current research and I'm excited to publish on it Great. and share with you all soon. Thank you. Sharon, what's upcoming for you? Um, I'm working with my wonderful colleagues in the Mandel Teacher Educator Teacher Education Institute, which is a um, two-year serious program of professional development for leaders of um, educational improvement, for instructional um, improvement leaders, on a book about um, this very complex and interesting program that has prepared several hundred people across the country, leaders in Jewish education, who are responsible for the ongoing development of, of educators. And um, I'm very excited about um, being able to sort of lift up and bring a complex multifaceted portrait of a program that's really working on both capacity building and identity development and leadership around the improvement of teaching and learning in Jewish education. So Wonderful. Look forward to hearing more. Joe. Yes. Well, my study of Shabbat has brought me to an interest in Shabbat as a spiritual resource. In these incredibly tense and difficult times, more and more people are looking not just the Shabbat, but are looking to Judaism as a kind of spiritual resource for how it is we're going to navigate uh, uh, and live in these troubling and difficult times. And um, so I, I think that's a fascinating um, development and a research possibility for our trying to understand. So in, if we were to look at Shabbat or other Jewish resources as a kind of spiritual treasure box. Um, how would we educate to make those treasures more commonly available to adult Jews throughout our community? Wonderful, wonderful. And we hope to uh, have a conference on Jewish spirituality um, in the spring. Jonathan, over to you last. Yeah, so in the spirit of uh, trying to take history and make it applicable. Um, I am hard at work on a book on the history of the Jewish day school movement. And um, I'm interested in this question, in, in this study, not only because it, believe it or not, there hasn't been a book on the history of the Jewish day school movement since the 60s, um, but also because the questions that uh, people were asking 50, 75 years ago, in many ways are the same questions that people are asking today. Um, whether we're talking about uh, the question of affordability, um, whether we're talking about the tension between identity uh, affirmation and identity building on the one hand versus creating a sense of tribalism and insularity on the other hand, um, or whether we're talking about the tension between on the one hand trying to inculcate religious values while on the other hand, um, you know, uh, operating a school in an achievement-based environment with middle and upper middle class 
kids or rich kids, honestly, who want to go to top colleges um, and how schools navigate these tensions. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Um, you've, you've, uh, we've, some of us have had the opportunity to read some of the, uh, drafts of the chapters. It's, it's terrific work and, and we're really looking forward to that. Um, we thank you all. We are, we are also looking forward to our next event. I want to just mention the next event, uh, at the Mandel Center is a learning about learning session. Um, the title is Navigating Ideological Differences in Pluralistic Jewish Schools with Dr. Esther Friedman and um, she will be in conversation with Ziva. Um, I want to encourage our audience members to remember to sign up for our mailing list, to follow us on um, Facebook and LinkedIn. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel and the podcast and all, all those things. Um, and I want to thank my wonderful colleagues um, for this conversation about uh, about the past, present, and future of Jewish learning. It's great to be in conversation with you today and, um, and always. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Take care.